This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we talk about things that matter. We're free thinkers and we don't believe in participation trophies. We're not afraid and unapologetically ourselves. It's time to create your own life. Hey everyone, Jeremy here, and uh, guys, I'm very excited for today's conversation because today's guest, we actually last spoke 10 days before the world shut down in March of 2020, and uh, this is a great time to restart. Today's guest is going to answer the question, when high achievers are action takers, but, ha- but action stops working, what do you do? He's a New York Times bestselling author. He scaled multiple companies, including a publishing company, to over $250 million. Today, he's going to help us mind our mindset. Michael Hyatt, welcome back to the show, sir. Hey, thanks, Jeremy. Thanks for having me on again. So I, I want to find out first and foremost, um, you know, I know you, you have been on the show earlier, so I'm going to redirect people to that episode to kind of hear more in depth about your story. But for those that aren't familiar with you, uh, tell us a little bit about, you know, what you do and, and your background. Yeah, so I spent most of my career in the book publishing field, but about 12 years ago, I founded a company called Full Focus, which is the company that that I'm associated with now. My daughter, my oldest daughter, is actually the CEO of our company. Her name is Megan Hyatt Miller. And uh, so I'm the chairman and the founder, and mostly I just create content now and report to her. So she's my boss. But uh, we do two things. We have a big planner business, a physical planner business called the Full Focus Planner, and we sold over a million copies of that, and it's a big part of our business. And then we also do business coaching. So we do we think of it as performance coaching for business owners. So let me ask you this, because I know last time you were on, we were looking more at like leadership and kind of the perspective on that, but uh, the book that you have out now is a little bit of a, a different perspective, and it, it's really around you know the science that shows success starts with your thinking. Could you unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, absolutely. You know, back in the early two thousands, I hired an executive coach, and it wasn't my first executive coach, but this was the first one who took this approach. And basically, her approach was that if you want different results. Your choices are you can work harder doing the things that you will think work. You can work faster. But the best way to affect the assault, the, the results is to go back upstream to your thinking because your thinking is the very thing that determines what results or what actions you're going to take that lead to the results. So thinking is where it begins. Thinking is everything. So let me just tell you a quick story that, where, that, that illustrates this. So soon after I started working with her, uh, we were in the middle of the Great Recession, and you're probably too young to remember it, but it was incredible. It was difficult leading through that challenging time, and I was running a big publishing company, the company you referenced in the intro, and uh, we had been affected by the by the economy as well. So she flew in in August, and the first thing she did, she used, would spend a day a month with me, and she said, okay, how did July turn out? And I said, well... Pretty disappointing, actually. Well, I said we were down about twenty uh, percent on sales, and we lost money, so it wasn't wasn't good. Yeah. So she said, "Wow, I'm really surprised by that because last time I was here last month, you were so confident that July was going to be a great month that you were on target that that you were going to hit your budget." I said, "I know, I know." She said, "So what do you think happened?" And I said, "Well, first of all, we're in the middle of a global recession." And I said, that's, you know, really impacted consumer confidence and people just aren't buying stuff. And I said, second of all, we're in the publishing industry and the publishing industry is in the midst of a digital revolution. You know, things are moving from physical books to Kindle. We're not sure what that, where that's going, but it's kind of upset the apple cart. And then finally, everything's been upended by social media because all the things that we, we thought worked with traditional media are no longer working. And she said, okay. She said, well... She said, what was it about your leadership that led to these results, led to the results in in the business this last month? Mm -hmm. And I was kind of offended. I thought, what do you mean my leadership? I just got done explaining to you why, why we had these results. You know, it was the economy, the publishing industry, social media. I said, that, that's the reason. 
She said, well, I, I get that. I, then those are real. But what was it about your leadership? And so, again, I kind of rehearsed the facts. I was really kind of perturbed by the fact that she asked me the question again. And so then she said to me, she said, okay, let me ask the question a different way. If you could go back 30 to 45 days ago and you could do something different, would you? And I said, oh, yeah. And she said, like, what? And I said, well, uh, I probably would have met with the sales team every day to make sure that they were tracking uh, against their goals and making progress like they, they hoped they would. She said, what else? I said, I probably would have gone on that call to Walmart and maybe even to Target just to make sure that, uh, you know, that, that our products were placed in there like they should have been placed in there. And so she said, okay, so, and I listed off three or four of the things. She said, okay, so you're telling me it was about your leadership. Mm -hmm. Now, here's the thing about it, Jeremy. As long as I was blaming the economy, my industry, and the state of marketing, the problem was out there. And I was a victim. There was nothing I could do. But once I accepted responsibility for my leadership, that I could have done things differently, I could have led in a different way. Because, I mean, literally every CEO, every business owner in the world was contending with the same thing. And some were making remarkable progress, much like the pandemic a few years ago. Mm -hmm. But I realized that once I took responsibility for my own thinking and learned to tell myself a different story, then all of a sudden I got the power back. It wasn't out there. It was in here. And that was something I could control. You know, there's a there's a couple different things that comes up for me on this. I think the first is like cause versus effect, right? Like if you look at it from that viewpoint, like it kind of stinks to realize, oh my gosh, you know, this is my level of responsibility. But at the same time, like if it's your level of responsibility, it means you can do something about it, right? It's a causative viewpoint where if it's just happening on the outside, it's an effect viewpoint. And that viewpoint, I think literally is, is vital to success. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's really important. In fact, in the book, Mind Your Mindset, we break the whole process down into a three-part process. And the very first and most important step is to identify the stories that are kind of shaping our reality, or at least our perception of reality. And that's not easy because leaders have to be self-aware and very few think about their thinking. But that's what we've got to learn how to do if we're going to, to change our stories. And the thing about it is, all of us have this person who lives inside of our head. And I call it, we call it in the book, the narrator. And the narrator is much like the color commentators uh, in a football game. You know, there's what's happening on the field. You know, there's this quarterback gets sacked or they make a first down or they score, you know, a field goal or whatever. Those are the facts. But then the commentators are telling you what it means. Mm -hmm. You know, they're telling you more importantly what it's going to mean, trying to project into the future. Well, our brain acts much in the same way. We are meaning-making machines. We cannot exist without meaning. We can't just take in the raw facts without assigning a meaning. But there's a vast difference between what happens and the meaning that you assign to what happens, and that meaning that we assign to what happens creates the stories that actually not only influence but really control our lives. So that first step is to... Um, identify those stories that there is a story and we've got to identify what is it the narrator is saying to us? How do you separate those two, right? Because I think there's there's things that are true, right, that are happening, that are occurring, but there's also at the same time, those, as you're mentioning, those things we tell ourselves. Oh, well, you know, um, you know, this person showed up late to work or I shouldn't have hired that person or that was a bad consultant or whatever it may be. Like we come up with all these reasons. So how do we separate like fact from fiction? Because to me, like if you can just work in fact, you're, you're going to get a lot more done. Yeah, well, I think, first of all, just to recognize the difference is the first step, that there are facts and then there are fiction. And that kind of gets us to step two, which is to interrogate our stories and ask ourselves the question, how much of the story that I'm really believing right now that is motivating my behavior, that's driving the actions that are leading to the results, how much of that story is rooted in reality? I'll tell you a story that a, a friend of mine, Dan Miller, tells. He grew up in a Mennonite community back, I don't know how many decades ago it was, but it was in the Midwest. And he said, you know, I could tell, I could take the facts of growing up and tell it like this. I grew up in this very oppressive religious community where we are not allowed to have modern technology. We didn't have a TV in the house. We didn't have a record player in the house. You know, we, we weren't able to do anything. We weren't really able to socialize. We didn't really know what was going on in the world. And it wasn't until I got out that my life 
opened up. Or he said, I could tell this story, again, based on the same set of facts. Mm-hmm. I grew up in this wonderful, close-knit community where we weren't distracted by television and other media, and we spent all this time together as a family and as a community helping one another. We played board games at night, and I'm very close to my siblings to this day because of that. So those are two different stories, same fact set, and that's where we have to be intentional about the the story that we tell. I, I grew up in a family with an alcoholic father, and for the longest time, I tell, told myself the story about how difficult it was growing up. And I was essentially the victim of my dad's drinking. And at some point, I kind of realized, and honestly, it wasn't that that long ago, maybe 10 years ago, that I realized, you know what? There was a huge gift in that for me. I'm not saying it was easy. And and for people who have suffered abuse at the hands of of an alcoholic, I'm not trying to minimize the damage. But I was able to get to the place in my story after some therapy, that this this had been a gift. I didn't get the father I wanted, but I got the father I needed. And that's what drove a lot of my my work drive, my work ethic, you know, my drive to succeed. And all that was good. It was a little bit overdialed at times, sure. but it was still, you know, all in all, uh, it was helpful. You, you know, what's really interesting. Um, like I, I find myself talking about adversity a lot, right? Like in adversity, is something that happens to us and it can be kind of like a like a blacksmith's forge right you come out the other side hopefully different and a lot of people will approach it for in two different ways you know one is oh my gosh that's terrible i'm going to go that way and eat cheetos on the couch where somebody else says okay i'm going to go through this and, and come out the other side different uh, i'm curious when when you look at this i guess how does adversity kind of play a part in this well you know adversity is can be hugely helpful but we've got to look at it through the lens of that you know, in other words, our whole mental framework when we come up against an adversity, like I'll give you an example. One of the things my, my wife loves to say whenever any adversity happens to us, and this is not the natural thing to say, but she will say, what does this adversity make possible? Because there's always possibility. I mean, it may be a simple adversity, like you're at the airport and your flight's delayed or canceled. And as you know, from traveling to airports, people go ballistic when this happens. You know, they yeah. rant and... I, I had to fly backwards across the United States to go to Ireland. So I've been there, man. Trust me. <laughs> well, and it's easy to think that, that somehow that shuts down possibility. But but I've been there before with my wife's question ringing in my ears saying, okay, I've got a delayed flight. I've got a canceled flight. What does this make possible? Well, one thing I know is that if I have a delayed or a canceled flight and I'm in an airport – And if I have access, and I know this is a little bit of privilege, but if I have access to like the Admirals Club or the Delta Club or, you know, one of those clubs, man, I can get a ton of work done. And, oh, by the way, I'm not distracted or interrupted by coworkers or anybody else. So I can be enormously productive. So what does it make possible? That. Sometimes maybe that I meet somebody in that situation. You know, there's tougher adversities, you know, that make possible a lot of things. Um, Another story. So I, I'm very healthy. You know, I've worked on my health for a long time, but I had a heart attack in September. Mm-hmm. It came out of the blue. I was asymptomatic. I get, I go to the doctor once or three times a year, get totally checked out, blood work, all that stuff. None of this was showing up. I had a high calcium score, but that was about it. So I ended up having a quadruple bypass surgery. Oh my wow. gosh. So then I had to go to cardiac rehab. So now I'm sitting in cardiac rehab, which is a hoot. I went this morning, in fact. But in cardiac rehab, I had uh, seven other patients beside myself sitting around a table. We work out together. We're monitored. We work out together. Then we're sitting around a table for sort of the education component of the whole experience. And so the nurse asked us, she said, okay, what does your heart attack mean? Great question. Because she was basically interrogating the story. What does your heart attack mean? So before they got to me, the guy right across, that was sitting across from me, he said, well, he said, I think it means it's downhill from here. You know, he said, oh I gosh. I feel like my life's, you know, pretty much over, that my best days are behind me, and then I'm going to just try to manage the decline and get by the best I can. I mean, that that was so foreign to me, that just, that blew my mind. Well, I had the the good fortune of being in the hospital when my doctor called and he talked to me right after the heart attack happened. In fact, I, I still was not out of ICU. And he called me and he said, look, whatever's happened 
has happened. Um, you and I both know that you've worked on your health for years. You've took it, you've taken control of what you could take control over, but then there's the genetic component. And he said, but here's the thing. I don't want you to think about the past at all. I want you to think about this like a reboot. You've got your entire future ahead of you. In fact, I would suggest, this is my doctor talking, your best days are ahead of you. You're going to be more productive than ever. You've got more blood flow to your brain than ever before. So this, this is like a giant reboot, and I can't wait to see what happens for you. Well, what do you think that did to my recovery versus this other patient in recovery? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I've really, I, I wouldn't say I've been elated, but, I said, but, I, but I've really been positive and optimistic through this, and it sped up my recovery. My thinking had an impact on my actions, and those actions had an impact on my results. So that's kind of how it works. This episode is sponsored by MyPillow, um, my favorite product that I take with me absolutely everywhere. I just spent a week up in Lake Placid, New York on a ski vacation, and uh, I actually have an extra MyPillow we leave up at the cabin. Really exciting and uh, keeps me from having neck trouble when I travel. So if you have that and uh, you want to prevent that, you can use my promo code, which is CYOL, and get up to 66% of select products at MyPillow.com. Up to 66% off select products. Go out and grab my favorite product, which is the MyPillow Classic. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. Also, this week, I am on Dr. Jason Dean's uh, new detox, as it's the full moon is coming up on the 6th of January, which is very, very soon. And uh, we are doing our detox of different parasites that are in our body. So if you guys want to join me on the parasite cleanse and uh, cleanse your body from those creepy little creatures that are crawling in there and causing a lot of conditions you're dealing with, <clears throat> you can head over to bravetv.store slash C-Y-O-L. Um, you get a discount over there as well. I believe it's about 20% if you use my promo code. So that is bravetv.store slash C-Y-O-L. It, it's so interesting because I see like that that gentleman you mentioned. Like I, I love my dad dearly. We're great friends. We talk a lot of baseball because we're we're big Yankee fans. But like I call my dad will call me to tell me when the phone rings. I know somebody most likely died, somebody's hurt, or something happened. Uh, you know, dangerous on the news. I should know about. I think at the same time, like we have to get better at kind of balancing what we pull in from the outside because at the same we allow those things to happen to us, right? So it's how can we balance what comes in from the outside versus how we're operating every day? Well, there's some things that, that we don't have control over. You know, there's going to be news that comes to us that yeah. we can't filter. Uh, there are going to be people, be people that say things to us that we can't filter or delete in real time. But there's also a lot of stuff that we ingest voluntarily that's not that helpful. Mm-hmm. Like when all you're doing is sitting in front of the news, watching 24-7, and there are lots of channels that are devoted to that 24-7. There ain't that much news, but here's what happens. You know, the news industry figured this out a long time ago is that fear and negativity sell. Their whole business model is driven by the need for clicks or eyeballs on their advertising. And they know that nothing works better than fear to do that or anger. You know, it's just kind of like how we evolved that we're going to stay focused on the things that scare us. And so their job is to distort the facts inflate the facts. And I'm not, you know, there's probably people that are in journalism that are in the media that that do a good job of this. But by and large, it's an industry that's driven by fear and negativity. So the more that you expose that yourself to that, the more you're going to end up like that. It's going to affect your thinking. Well, it's it's the idea of garbage in, garbage out. But uh, Michael, you talked about two different things here, you know, identifying the problem and the story surrounding it, interrogating the story. But I actually want to go back a little bit earlier because it seems like there's almost like a, that's one and two, but it seems like there's almost a zero here. And, and that's the idea of accepting it. A lot of us, like, I think going back to the basic, like, how do we accept that, you know, we are the problem, but also the solution? Like, how do you start there? Because then it seems to me like one and two wouldn't go in if, if you can't accept everything after it. Well, I think this is where the, the brain science comes in, because we have in our brain things called concept cells. And those concept cells, essentially, each one of them will hold a different concept. Like, you know, I have a concept that there's a chair or what a car is. And that's really a whole 
constellation of of cells that that create that concept. But but our brain doesn't stop there. Our brain has to make stories out of all that. And so these stories just naturally occur. But and this is kind of, you know, step zero, like you said, is is people don't realize that these stories are stories. They conflate what's happening with their interpretation of what's happening. So when they're recounting to you or recounting to themselves in real time about what just happened, they're identifying the story as the truth. And it's probably at best some version of the truth, but it's nonetheless a story. This is why you can have eyewitnesses who both witness, have two eyewitnesses witness a car wreck, and they will tell you two different stories of what happened. And if you get three different witnesses, you get three slightly different stories. And that's why it's important to have more than one witness to try to figure out what in the world just happened here. It's, it's so important to have that reality to kind of be able to handle things. And I guess when we're looking at it then, so we, we identify the problem, we interrogate the story. How do we come up with a better solution that works then, right? And I think the important thing, point I want to make about that is I think sometimes people think the first solution has to work. It's not always the first one, but I'm curious how we go at that. Yeah, well, I think, uh, you know, the third step actually in our process, first identify, second interrogate, then third, imagine a better mm -hmm. story. And this is where we kind of have to go back to the narrator. And I found it very helpful in my own practice um, to basically write down what the narrator is saying to me. Because the narrator typically uh, works by putting sentences in our head. Now, we think it's just us thinking, right? But there's this narration that's going on in our brain, these sentences in our head. And to write those down on a piece of paper and say, what am I saying about this? Another story, back in the early 90s, um, actually the late 80s, I had started a, a book publishing company with a close friend of mine. And the book company did great. Right up until 1992, we got in a relationship with a distributor. And basically, through a, a series of uh, decisions that they made, our company was forced into bankruptcy. And uh, it, it was a hard lesson. And so going bankrupt was humiliating. It was embarrassing. It was depressing. You know, it was a lot of things. But then a couple of years later, I had a mentor, somebody that was really important to me. We were sitting on a plane together and he said to me, you know, you're not very good with money, are you? Wow. Well, first of all, was that a fact or an opinion? It was his opinion. Mm -hmm. It was a story that he had based on a, a few facts that he knew about my life, and he had come up with a conclusion. Here was the problem. I didn't realize it was a story. He was a mentor. He was a, a, you know, kind of an authority figure in my life. I saw it as the truth. Gosh, I'm just not very good with money. And I spent the next five or six years proving that mm -hmm. because my thinking influenced my actions, which delivered the results. And it wasn't until I began to say, wait a second, is that true? And started writing down what the narrator was saying that I could say, hey, I could re-engineer this. I could, I could be telling myself a different story. What's a more empowering story? Well, a more empowering story would be, uh, I'm learning how to be a better manager of money. Mm -hmm. Or I'm getting better with money. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to say something like, you know, I'm a billionaire. You know, I mean, that's the kind of thing that creates the cognitive dissonance that you, you, you have a hard time believing. But to be able to, to go ahead and reframe it and see it as something you could learn. And I've, you know, I've been relatively successful with money, but I had to change the story to do that. That it's so interesting you point that out because I think oftentimes like you know maybe we have conversations with others or we give others advice and so many times like our own viewpoints and what we see happening in our life is what kind of colors that guidance we give people and I think sometimes even when we're giving people that advice we have to step back from well is this my reality or is this someone else's reality? It's really true and it's important to separate that fact from the fiction. And I think one of the things that, that I listen for in my coaching practice when I'm coaching entrepreneurs is I'm listening to their language because language will reveal what we're thinking. It's, it's hard sometimes mm -hmm. to be aware of our own thinking or to be aware in real time of our own language and what that reveals about our thinking, but we can oftentimes hear it in other people. I was sitting on a plane one time on my way to San Diego for a big speaking engagement. And uh, just as I sat down uh, on the plane, I got a call from a good friend of mine. And he said, hey, what you doing? And I said, well, I have to go to San Diego to give a speech. Dead silence. 
He said, wait a second. You said you have to go to San Diego to give a speech. And I said, yeah, that's what I just said. And he said, as long as I've known you, your dream has been to be an author and a public speaker. You're going to frickin' San Diego, you know, best climate <laughs> on the planet. You're giving a speech, the thing that you've, you've said you, you love doing and you wanted to do more of. I don't think you have to do anything. Nobody held a gun to your head. You get to do this. One little word made all the difference. And so ever since then, whenever I have to do something, you know, unless somebody has forced me to do it, which almost never happens, I try to say I get to do that because that's a different thinking framework. That's a different approach to reality. And it's against a story, but it's a story that's more empowering than a negative story I could be telling myself. Well, Michael, you talk about the idea of intuition in the book a lot as well. Um, and, you know, I guess when we're looking at that, you know, where does intuition come from? Because it, it's, it's interesting. You mentioned that and it felt really real to me because I've, I, I don't know, whenever I've like went with my gut, I found my gut's usually right. And I'm, I'm curious, yeah. where does intuition come from? Well, intuition uh, doesn't come from our executive function of our brain, the frontal cortex. It's a much more primitive thing and it's designed to keep us alive. And what our intuition is able to do that our executive function usually can't do is to process data and perceptions and cues at a very high speed in real time. So we tell the story in the book about a race car driver who has got the pedal to the metal. He's about to crest a hill and, he's, and, the, and the crowd on the, on the left, there's a huge crowd watching him. All of a sudden, his intuition tells him, hit the brakes. He has no idea why. I mean, he's really not th even thinking about this. He hits the brakes. And he avoided this huge 20-car pileup on the other side of the hill that he couldn't wow. see. And so afterwards, they were deconstructed. How did you know to hit the brakes? I mean, it saved your life, probably saved some other people's lives because you didn't run into them. How did you know? Well, after they sussed it out, he didn't know either initially. But the crowd was not looking at him coming down the straightaway, which is what they would have normally done in a normal race. They were looking over the hill. Their eyes were fixated because they were, had the elevation to see it. Their eyes were fixated on the crash. And his intuition picked that up and said, something's wrong. I better stop. Wow. And that's how our intuition works. It's not infallible. Sometimes it does make a mistake. I had a mistake earlier this week based on my intuition. I thought I was dead right, but I wasn't right. But, but generally speaking, you know, 90% of the time it's right. It works best when it's corroborated by our executive function. So the executive function loves reasons. So even if we come to the conclusion, like we're trying to hire somebody mm -hmm. and we have an intuition, it's great if we can come up with some reasons too that express what our more primitive brain is doing faster in real time. Because if you're trying to convince a colleague why you should hire that person, it's probably usually not enough to say, well, I just have an intuition. Most people need more than that. It's really interesting because I've used like intuition a lot with like employees and, and handling situations, but it's really important in how you do it, right? Because I think so many times we think, okay, so I noticed this, so this is probably happening and that's probably happening. So what we've typically done is we sit down and we say, I noticed X, Y, Z, tell me what's happening. And it's so interesting to just kind of get into that conversation without anybody feeling wrong and you realize okay, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was, but there was a situation. How are we going to handle that? Yeah. How you approach your intuition is vital. It, it is. And, and particularly when we come to an intuition that we can't yet justify. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the ways that my daughter Megan likes to do this, and when she has an intuition about somebody or something, she'll say, you know, she, she said, tell me, tell me if you think I'm wrong, but, and then she'll express her intuition. And, and usually that at least gives her an out in case she's totally off base. But it also makes it sound less authoritative, like the other person has no maneuvering room. Mm -hmm. So just like, tell me if I'm wrong, but, you know, it seems to me that you're anxious at this moment or you're reluctant to take on this task or whatever it is. So that's, that's a good hack around it. So let me ask you this, Michael. Like when we look at this book, you know, what, what's the goal of mind your mindset. Like, you know, what do you want readers to have by the time they get to the end of this? Man, it's, I, I really think our thinking, self-awareness about our thinking and the ability to engineer our thinking is the ultimate superpower. You know, if you want bigger, better results, if you ever find yourself frustrated because you're not getting the results you want, 
or disappointed in the results you're getting, or you're just curious why you're getting the results, getting inside your own thinking is the best way to change the outcome. So the reason that we wrote the book, and again, I wrote the book with my oldest daughter, the reason we wrote the book is because we wanted to give people kind of a, a shortcut so that they could have the benefit of better thinking without having to just kind of hack it on their own by trial and error, which largely, if it hadn't been for the executive coach I, I, I had, I wouldn't have gotten to it so quickly, but it's still been a process. So we've taken everything we've learned about thinking and about the neuroscience of thinking and put that in one book so that people can get bigger, better results faster than they could otherwise. Michael, this has been awesome. And I, I do appreciate you being willing to come back, um, you know, and be on the show again. I, th I think, you know, we're really at the beginning of the year. I think we're really coming out of what we've been going through the past couple of years. And I think people really need this now. So, you know, where can they find it and where can they find you? Yeah, the best place to find the book is at mindyourmindsetbook.com. And if you go there, go buy the book from any retailer and don't buy the audio book. And I'll tell you why. We're giving over $500 worth of free bonuses when you buy the book and come back with your receipt. And one of the bonuses is the audio copy of the book. There's another bonus that's the actual uh, a course that Megan and I created around the book. And that's all free just for buying the book. And you can find out everything else about me if you go to fullfocus.co, C-O, not com, co, fullfocus.co. There you can get links to all my other books and our podcasts and everything else. Well, Michael Hyatt, I appreciate your time today, sir. Thanks, Jeremy. 